Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 149 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we're going to talk about exactly what it is that Staph Aureus does to wreck your skin. Some of you may remember that I created an entire episode for you guys about how to know if you have a staph infection, which I find to be incredibly important because so many people struggle with staph. They think they're just having a flare of their eczema or their psoriasis or whatever, because this is not an eczema specific problem, by the way. And what they don't realize is that lo and behold, it's not that you're just having a flare. It's that you actually have an issue with staph overgrowth. So if it hasn't been fully clear to you as to why we talk about staph, or it's also known as Staphylococcus aureus, this episode is going to clearly explain and lay all of this out for you because staph is pretty damaging. And that's why it's important to jump on it sooner rather than later. Before we dive into this interview, and by the way, my team that helped create this episode found this interview incredibly enlightening. So I know that you guys are going to love it. I wanted to share a review from one of our listeners. Her name is Christina Lake. She left a five-star review over on iTunes sharing that Jennifer Fugo and the Healthy Skin Show are synonymous with hope for me. I've been battling severe eczema for over half of my life now. Countless doctors, tests, treatments, and diets have not been able to bring lasting resolution, even when trying to treat it with a natural, holistic approach. I finally caved and turned to a drug, which was amazing for a few years, but in the long run caused severe enough problems that I found myself enduring a hospital stay. To say that it was a dark time is an understatement. I had very little hope left. So when I first heard Jennifer being interviewed on a podcast, I was intrigued. I looked her up and very quickly started devouring her podcast and other resources. The more I listened, the more my hope started to build. Finally, someone who knew, who truly cared, and who actually has some solid answers. I love how I can trust Jennifer to bring me the latest and best research, interviews with the top experts and most knowledgeable people out there, and her own invaluable clinical experience, commitment, and compassion. For the first time in many years, I'm daring to hope that I can actually get beyond this, that eczema doesn't have to be a major part of my life forever. I'm still on a journey to find complete healing, but your whole life changes when you feel like healing is actually possible. And even better, the hope that you have given me has not only been for my benefit, but also benefited others with whom I have shared it with. Thank you, Jennifer. And you know what? Thank you, Christina. I really appreciate that, number one, you took action. And number two, that you are sharing this because you're right. It really stinks when you are struggling so much and you're just told you're going to have to learn to live with this. You're just going to have to learn to manage it. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe it's genetic. And you're given no hope from the people that you turn to who are considered to be experts in their particular field. And so it's truly my honor to be on this journey with each and every one of you. And I appreciate each of you who also share your experiences with the Healthy Skin Show with others out there to let them know why you love the show so much. And I love that I have this opportunity to give back to each and every one of you. We have so much amazing content and interviews and information coming your way. I mean, we're like three months out, believe it or not, with more and more stuff that I am always putting together for you guys. And I feel deeply humbled that I have this opportunity to connect you with things that could really change your daily experience in your life and help you feel like a normal person again. That's why it is so important that each and every one of us who is committed to supporting this community of people struggling with chronic skin rashes, that we are dedicated to sharing, not hoarding, sharing the information that we find that is helpful. So make sure 
to share. You guys know I always ask you to do that after every single episode. So because today's interview went a tad long, I want to dive straight in. I'm actually excited about my guest today. And for those of you who are practitioners, please listen in because we've got a really cool opportunity for you to learn more about the skin and the skin microbiome that we'll be talking about toward the end of the episode. So let's dive into today's interview. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. My guest today is someone whom I'm really excited to have on the show because she's just as much of a nerd about things as I am. And I'm hoping today that we can make this topic, which we're going to dive into staff aria, something that is both informative, but kind of fun. I I think we should put on our curiosity caps today because, you know, especially for people that are struggling with eczema, though, to be fair, I have worked with clients who have psoriasis, who have Uh, issues with staph infections. Um, I think you're going to find this incredibly interesting. So my guest today is Dr. Julie Greenberg. She's a licensed naturopath who specializes in integrative dermatology. She is the founder of the Center for Integrative Dermatology, a holistic dermatology clinic that approaches skin problems by finding and treating the root cause. Dr. Greenberg holds degrees from Northwestern University, Stanford University, and Bastyr University, and received advanced clinical training at the Dermatology Clinic at the University of Washington Medical School and at the Pediatric Dermatology Center at Seattle Children's Hospital. She is also the program chair of the Naturopathic and Integrative Dermatology Series on LearnSkin.com, a learning platform for integrative healthcare professionals. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Greenberg. Thanks so much for having me, Jen. You know, I love the Healthy Skin Podcast and I have listened to every single episode that's on it. And I just get excited when a new episode comes out. So thanks for having me. Yeah, I am excited because you were going to talk about a topic that nobody has talked about yet. And I find the whole staff arias topic really fascinating. But when you approached me with this idea, I was like, we have to talk about this because it's it's not just that staph is a bug, right, that we have on our skin that we don't really want there. There's so much more around it that can impact skin health. And so that's, I'm so glad you want to talk about this today with me. <laughs> yeah, staph is it's such a big player when it comes to skin disease. And we naturally think of it with like things like atopic dermatitis, or if you have an infection, like a boil, Um, But it can, like you said, be present, uh, can overlay psoriasis plaques. It can be involved with acne, rosacea, um, just lots of different presentations. But uh, definitely close association between staph aureus and atopic dermatitis. Yeah. And so with that said, what is the relationship between eczema and staph? So as we know, I mean, eczema is a complicated, you know, multifactorial disease. But as far as the skin barrier, I mean, that's one big component of atopic dermatitis is that we have a compromised skin barrier. And really, whenever I see patients who are having an eczema flare, I'm automatically thinking there's a staph aureus problem. Now, there's kind of a range of, um, you know, the amount of staph that's on a skin When there's a lot of staph, we call it a staph infection. And then you're looking at that crusting, oozing, you know, really awful looking skin. And that's when people start to think like, oh, maybe I have an infection. But even if you're not at that level, we can have colonization. Now, colonization can be you have it. If I cultured your skin or my skin, either of us could have staph aureus on our skin right now. But it might be at low enough levels that it's not causing a problem. And we have natural... um, things on our skin that help bite it. So at 20% of people out there, if you cultured them, you're going to find staph aureus, not a problem for them. Then when we look at people with atopic dermatitis and we culture them, they have much level, much higher levels of colonization, both in terms of how many people are colonized and how much staph aureus is on the skin. And even then when we look at lesional skin on eczema sufferers, it goes up even more. So when I have a patient present to me with an eczema flare, I'm just already thinking there's a very, very high likelihood that staph is playing a problem with the skin barrier, and I know I need to address the staph. I don't even need to culture it. I just, I know it's a problem. I see atopic derm flare, I think staph. Mm. And and pH is also in, 
important too with the skin. I mean, I've seen a lot of people that don't think that the pH of their skin is important. There's a lot of push out there online and holistic communities and wellness communities that everything in the body should be alkaline. <laughs> uh, what would you say to that? Yeah. So the body has very specific pHs that it needs all over the body. Blood, for example, very tight regulation. It wants to be about 7.4, which is neutral. The skin, people are surprised to learn the healthy place for skin is an acidic pH. And that is so important. And um, particularly as it relates to things like staph and other pathogens. So we have these great uh, things on our skin called antimicrobial peptides what it sounds like. They are things to fight microbes on the skin, and they can really only function in an acidic pH. And once the pH on our skin goes up, uh, these guys are basically inactivated. So defensin is one of them. Defensin is, you know, you want to talk about geeky. It, I think <laughs> of it like a, a superhero, right? And it deserves a cape and a big D on its chest. And it goes, it's just on our skin and it's looking for bacteria and viruses and fungus. And it sees it and like, bam, you know, it pokes holes in it and kills it. But it cannot function mm. at a higher pH. And not only that, Staph aureus loves a higher pH. So we want skin, like an ideal is like four to five, maybe for the pH. When staph gets up to 7.5, it's like, baby, I'm home. This is where I want to be. And it just starts to grow and flourish. And then the things like um, defensin and, you know, those natural antimicrobial peptides, they can't function at that higher pH and fight it. So looking at and treating the skin pH is one of the main topical treatments that I use in um, treating atopic dermatitis flares. And to boot, it actually creates healthy skin. So, you know, People's skin will have less wrinkles. It will appear mm -hmm. glowing and beautiful. It wants an acidic pH. It's super important. Yeah. And I, I cannot agree with you more. And especially too, with all of the excessive body washing, I'm not saying you shouldn't shower, but there are some people that shower way too much. They wash their hands way too much. And that can increase the skin's pH as a result of contact with water and soap, which is very alkaline. And so we don't realize that it's not, I don't think the things are inherently bad. That's not the point, but that excessive exposure to certain things can actually create a situation where now it's more, your environment is now more favorable to staff. And so you mentioned something that I've heard from a few other practitioners about the nose, our nose. So what is the relationship between staff and the nose? So I'm sure that many of your listeners, either patients themselves or practitioners, have the experience. They've treated staph infections, right? The staph infection goes away. Yay, we've conquered it. And then before you know it, it is back with a vengeance. And it's like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? Well, staph aureus is sneaky. And the place that it likes to hide out and colonize are in the nose, right? And so even if you take an antibiotic like a doxycycline and you clean up the staph infection on the skin, it's really hard for it to get in the nose. And so it's just hiding out there, waiting, biding its time. And you're right. So using soaps, soaps can be a pH of up to 12. It's super alkaline. So it's waiting for that right environment. And it's, you know, right here. And then it just quickly comes out and colonizes the skin again. So absolutely part of any treatment plan when you're dealing with staph, when you're dealing with eczema flares, you have to treat the colonization in the nose or it's just a vicious cycle of you clean it, it comes back, you clean it, it comes back. We want to get rid of it for good. And so do you do you do a culture in the, in the nares or in the nasal cavity? Do you, do you do like a culture swab or how do you identify if staph is hiding there? So again, I mean, you certainly can. You can do bacterial and fungal cultures in the nose. But again, I I just know when I am looking at a patient with an eczema flare, it's a factor. And so we just go ahead and treat the nose. So there's a variety of um, botanicals. If you go to the dermatologist, they may prescribe something like a mupirocin ointment and an antibacterial ointment to put up there. It's it's 
it can be effective, but then it can also not get it at all. I, of course, being a naturopathic doctor, I like to use kind of more uh, natural botanicals. And there's a lot of options. You can do colloidal silver sprays. They make nasal sprays. Um, if you're looking for products, it might say vertical spray. It's like an FDA labeling. So you'll look for nasal spray or vertical spray. Colloidal silver is good. Um, and you, there's propolis sprays and there's, there's other things that you can do. Um, but yeah, you, you need to treat the, the nose. Um, and I, if a patient wants to do a culture, we can, but it's just an extra expense. So mm. I, I rarely do that. And what about if someone was to have a really bad flare around their eyes? Does that also kind of clue you? I've heard that sometimes like if you have these recurrent really bad rashes around the eyes, like you, that's, that could be a sign that you want to take a look at what's going on in the nose. Yeah. I mean, the eyes can be many things. I also see actually a lot of uh, sebderm, seborrheic dermatitis mm -hmm. that flares around the eyes and people get misdiagnosed with um, eczema when it's actually a malassezia, which is a yeast that causes dandruff at like sebum. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends. It can be either. But the good news is um, that a lot of these pathogens, so whether you're talking about like malassezia or candida, so yeast and fungus, Staph aureus, even herpes virus, they all want this really alkaline skin. And by using really beautiful natural botanicals like aloe vera gel, uh, hydrosols, um, even apple cider vinegar sprays, we lower the skin pH mm -hmm. and we make it healthy against all pathogens. So again, you don't necessarily need to even like culture the eyes and see what's going on. As, one thing that you can start doing is using these botanicals to lower the skin pH and make it a place that none of those pathogens can mm. thrive or want to be. So. Yeah. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about the damage that staph does, because it's not just its presence <laughs> that's the problem. It's it, it causes a lot of damage. So how exactly does staph create this sort of train wreck on your skin? Yeah, staph has a lot of tools at its disposable for wreaking havoc on your skin. Um, one thing that it does is it stimulates something called proteases. Um, proteases are enzymes that break down proteins on the skin. And specifically, um, staph aureus stimulates proteases that break down keratinocytes, so the skin cells. Right. So first, it's, it's breaking it down. Um, it produces things called virulence factors, which... Um, it actually creates inflammatory cytokines. Cytokines are chemicals on your skin that cause inflammation. And with this chronic inflammation, your skin just can't heal. And again, now the pH is probably high, so the things like the defensins can't work, right? And so it just creates this whole environment where we can't fight it. Then some strains of Staph aureus um, produce things called toxins, like alpha toxin and beta toxins. And they are what they sound like. They are toxins. And they actually form these structures that poke holes in your skin. Oh, my and, goodness. Yeah. And so uh, there's, there's kind of a bigger problem. And so obviously, if you've got holes in our skin, it, it's very hard for it to heal. But it also allows other things into the skin. It allows pathogens in, food proteins. And we know something, there's something called an atopic march, where people kind of start off with eczemas, babies and kids. And then a lot of them will go on to develop food allergies and asthma. And we think that Staph aureus has a big role to play in that with these um, toxins poking holes in the skin. It allows food proteins and pathogens like pollens and stuff from the air to get in and get presented to the immune system in a way they were never meant to. And then this causes the body to think suddenly like, oh, this egg is a you know bad thing. And suddenly now we have a food allergy, whereas we never had one before. And they've done studies with mice where they've actually created food allergies in mice that never had them by basically poking holes in the skin and then layering like egg protein over it. And suddenly they had IgE food allergies several weeks down the line where they never had it before. So wow. staph, staph aureus is really a bad guy. We really want to clean it up. And, um, you know, I try to remind people that staph is not just an atopic dermatitis issue because I have had the experience of working with psoriatic clients and they've actually had problems with it. 
if you have skin issues in general, even if it's just a quote unquote dermatitis, because some people can't get a diagnosis, even though they've seen a number of dermatologists, do you think it's worthwhile from your experience to always consider staff pretty much regardless of what type of chronic skin issue you might have? I think it's always important to think that it could be playing a role just because it's so prevalent. Um, again, I mean, 20% of people out there, if you if you swab them, they will have staph aureus on their skin and that's healthy skin, mm. right? So once we start talking about skin that is not healthy and is compromised, you always have to be thinking about staph aureus as a potential factor. Now, again, I don't think that means that you necessarily need to go out and culture it unless You've got a raging infection and you know, say you're going to get on an antibiotic. Yeah, then that's a good idea. You want to know exactly what you're fighting before you get on an antibiotic. But using strategies like lowering the skin pH with botanicals or, um, and we didn't talk about coconut oil. I know you're not a huge fan of it, but there's a lot of studies that show that um, like four weeks of using coconut mm -hmm. oil twice a week can really help with eradicating staph. Um, there are antibacterial components to coconut oil. And I, I use coconut oil judiciously. I don't like it on the face because it's um, comedogenic. It can cause acne. And I don't like just coconut oil on the skin for months at a time because it can actually be drying, but it can be useful uh, in helping to fight staph. That's good. Um, to know. That's actually a really good point because I think... I think a lot of times we want to be black and white. A lot of people want you to be black and white, like, yes or no, this is good, this is bad. But the truth of the matter is, I think where I've kind of come from with it is that we're probably as a society have over assumed that coconut oil is like this panacea of amazingness, which it is, but there's pros and cons to everything. And so maybe we need to take it a step back. And as you're saying, there are times and places where it can be really helpful, but you're not using it every day on end, slathering yourself head to toe with it. Exactly. Um, and so I wanted to ask you a quick question. If you have any experience or any thoughts on if you have staph aureus on the skin, there's some really interesting research like that I've been reading recently about the incidence of people with atopic dermatitis having staph aureus in their GI tract as well. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So as a naturopathic doctor, I do do functional medicine testing. And of course, looking at and treating the gut is a big component of how I treat the underlying root cause for a lot of skin conditions, including atopic dermatitis. Um, so yeah, so I've run a, a lot of stool tests and it is certainly not uncommon to see an overgrowth of staph aureus on a stool test in uh, atopic derm patients, very common. Um, that's not always the case, but we know that there's a gut skin um, mm -hmm. connection. And so it it is definitely, I mean, part of my protocol for treating atopic dermatitis is also treating the gut. Uh, and again, it's helpful to have a stool test and see what's exactly in there. But I'm never surprised when I see staph aureus in the stool as overgrowth and it happens all the time. And so I think that's an important point to mention is that we have these different microbiomes and they, they, uh, they communicate with one another. I think that's the easiest way to think about it. And I don't know if we fully understand every which way that they communicate. I think we're, we are learning in a constant state of learning. And uh, I know one of the great resources we wanted to mention to everybody today, especially practitioners, is the Learn Skin platform where there is going to be a lot of content that is releasing around helping people understand all of these different facets of looking at microbiome issues, looking at nutrient issues and all sorts of things, because education, I think at this point is the key for us to be able to make a bigger impact in helping people overcome these issues. Absolutely. I mean, we have uh, at least a thousand different species of bacteria on our skin and that doesn't include all of the fungal and yeast species yeah. and, you know, viruses. And there's a whole world living on our skin. And, you know, we're starting to pay a lot more attention to it. I think the gut microbiome has gained a lot of traction over the past few years. And just now are we thinking about the skin microbiome? And, and absolutely, they're connected. You know, we don't know all the ways because there are definitely different bacteria on the skin than occur mm -hmm. um, in the gut. Uh, but they speak to each other. 
they're connected. And our skin microbiome, the health of our skin microbiome is just as important to the health of our skin as, you know, our gut microbiome is to our internal health. And there's a fascinating study that shows um, basically, I mean, to, to speak to Staph aureus is an even bigger problem with atopic derm, that right before someone gets a flare, we want like high microbial diversity on our skin of obviously the good ones and Staph aureus to be low or non-existent. And the study showed that right before a flare, for some reason, the, the diversity of the microbiome plummets. And at the same time, Staph aureus shoots up and we're not sure why that happens. We're not sure if this is a function of pH where, again, if somebody's maybe soaping and not, you know, the skin isn't able to recover. And so all of those bacteria that need an acidic skin pH die off. And then staff is like, ooh, this is my chance. Here I go. But basically, you don't, you don't get the eczema flares until the microbial diversity plummets and the staph uh, colonization increases. And uh, conversely, you don't get resolution of the eczema until the Staph aureus uh, population decreases and the microbial diversity increases again. So it's even more important why we really need to pay attention to skin pH and the microbiome of the skin. It, it, it is the foundations for health of the skin. Yeah, and it's super important. And I want to make sure that people can connect with you because you're a fantastic resource and you have so much information that... I mean, even just having this conversation, I, I feel like a little, I'm like nerding out. I love it. It's so fun. <laughs> I hope all the listeners are like, I know my, I know the listeners love this kind of stuff because I mean, we've done enough of these shows at this point to know, like they really love diving into answering these deeper questions, but they can find you at integrativedermatologycenter.com. Check out your practice and you tell us a little bit about your practice. Yeah, so uh, I'm physically based in Los Angeles, but I see patients throughout California and Washington via telehealth. Um, and for patients in other states or other countries, I can't treat them directly, but I can work with their licensed healthcare practitioners um, to help uh, you know, improve and implement treatment plans for them. And I'm always available to answer questions, so people can fr feel free to you know, submit questions or ping me on my site. Um, and I'm happy to respond to them. Yeah. And, and because you're doing such fantastic work too on, uh, over at learnskin.com, you've been like compiling all of this amazing information to put out. Um, and we're going to start that, I think that's June 25th, correct? Yes. Yes. We have a series of 25, uh, 20 courses that really do a deep dive into all of this kind of stuff, like the underlying root cause of skin disease. And, um, um, you have co-authored <laughs> a really important article called Gut Dysbiosis in Skin Health that I think people are going to just, their minds are going to be blown. And it's it's what, you know, the integrative and what these kinds of communities have been talking about for years, but it shows all the published research in one place, like all the gut dysfunction, what is happening in atopic dermatitis in the gut? What is happening in the gut with psoriasis? And there you guys have just done a fantastic job of laying out the research that is just unbelievable on how much gut dysfunction contributes to these chronic skin diseases. And just further that like, you know, you, you can put a steroid cream on atopic dermatitis or on, you know, you can try to treat a psoriasis plaque but you're just not getting to the underlying root cause unless you're looking at the gut. And um, I think this course will be free for a while. So yeah, if people want to go check out your excellent work, Aww. they can go to <laughs> learnskin.com and it's just fantastic information. Yeah. And well, and thank you too for the opportunity. I appreciate the time and, and, and energy that you're putting into creating resources like this along with Learn Skin and I just love being a part of it. So um, I want to thank you, first of all, for putting together this idea to have this conversation here on the Healthy Skin Show and, and the time that you took today to share all this great information. I know people are going to love it. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I hope that you guys enjoyed this interview from Dr. Greenberg. I love talking to her and I assure you she's going to come back because I have more things that I would love to pick her brain about and make sure that you guys get access to that information as well. 
And for those of you interested in the course that myself and Jennifer Brand, my colleague whom you've heard on the show, put together through the Learn Skin platform, you can head on over to the show notes over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 149 and get access to the links and anything else that we discussed in this episode. If you have any questions or comments, you can also leave them there. That way we can keep the conversation going. And as I was saying in the beginning of this episode, what makes this community so incredibly special and the thing that I love about you guys is your passion and commitment to share. So if you found this episode insightful, remember this is not eczema specific. I've had clients who have psoriasis or seborrheic dermatitis that also have overgrowth issues with staff. So it's important that we connect others with the reason why we need to be so on top of this bug that loves to take over the skin microbiome and cause all sorts of trouble. This episode could be incredibly enlightening to someone else, and that may be a really critical step on their journey. So make sure to share this episode with them. And if you have been moved, helped, supported, inspired, or just given some hope by the Healthy Skin Show and the episodes that we've had, please take a moment to rate and review the show. That way people will know as they're looking for new podcasts to tune into the value of tuning in. So with that said, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.